being chased and bitten by a dog is a nightmare to almost all of us, right? Add to that the picture of receiving multiple injections and dreading the fatal rabies infection. An experience which none of us would want to have. Well, in this video, let's look at all these things in detail, cover some important aspects of first aid following a dog or any other animal bite, and then also look at the latest guidelines of rabies vaccination. Do make sure that you watch this video till the end so that you know what exactly to be done and what not to be done if any of your near or dear one ends up having a dog bite. Rabies is an infection of the nervous system caused by this RNA virus and it is transmitted by the bite of an infected animal and till date it remains the most lethal infection known to mankind because once the infection sets in the victim is sure to die and what makes it even worse is this death is preceded by a few days of severe agony. On the other hand if an exposure to an animal is confirmed and timely vaccination is initiated this can almost always be avoided. Rabies has been known to mankind for over 4,000 years now. There are evidences of references to rabies in Eshuna node of Mesopotamian civilization around 2000 BC. At least five old Mesopotamian dog incantations clearly reflect the notion that rabies is caused by something present in the saliva of an infected animal. Although it remains disputed, the word rabias, which is a Latin word for rabies, may have originated from the word rabas or rabasa, a Sanskrit word which means violent, fierce or wild. And there are also a lot of evidences of rabies being mentioned in old Vedic literatures and scripts of India, China, Egypt and Middle East. In 100 AD, Celsus described the human rabies and also coined the term hydrophobia which refers to fear of water. He also clearly demonstrated that the virus dwells in the salivary system of an infected animal. What all are the modes of transmission of infection to humans? The one mode which all of you are aware is the dog bite, right? But is that the only way of transmission to humans? Clearly no. Basically, the virus dwells in the salivary system of an infected animal. Now, this animal can be dog or it can be any other animal like a cat, a monkey or wild animals or even bat for that matter. So obviously, when the virus is dwelling in the salivary system, so it can easily be transmitted by the bite of an animal. But in addition to this, the transmission can also take place in case of a scratch or abrasion if it gets secondarily contaminated with the saliva. There are also reports of virus transmission as aerosol in case of laboratory accidents or in caves with millions of bats inside. There are some unfortunate incidences of the disease transmission in case of organ transplantation as well. But in 99% of the cases, the transmission of infection takes place because of the bite of an infected animal. When a rabid dog bites a human being, the viral particles get deposited in the muscles of the victim by attaching to this receptor. Now from here, they get into the nerve endings and then travel towards the spinal cord by what is called as fast axonal flow. After they reach the spinal cord, they can move to any other body part by traveling along any of the nerves. Okay, so if a person is bitten by a rabid dog or rabid animal, two things can happen. Either he consults a doctor and receives necessary vaccination about which we shall discuss a little later or he doesn't consult a doctor and doesn't receive any treatment. Now this mainly happens in case of a wild animal bite or bat bite simply because most of the people are unaware of the fact that rabies transmission can take place even with non-dog bites. After the bite of a rabid animal, the so-called incubation period lasts from about 20 days to 90 days but it can sometimes be as short as less than a week. So following this incubation period, initially non-specific prodromal symptoms appear like fever, chills, excessive tiredness, irritability, decreased hunger, etc. 
Now, this non-specific prodromal symptoms can last for about 10 days, after which the proper neurological symptoms start appearing. To begin with, it starts with tingling sensation, pain and numbness around the bite site. Mind you, even though the bite wound would have healed by then. So after this, there can be two types. That is encephalitic rabies, which is a most common type and involves the brain and paralytic rabies, which is the which is not so common. Let's first look at the encephalitic rabies. Now this involves sleeplessness, irritability, hyper excitability, hallucinations, confusion, aggressive behavior, etc. Now this can also involve some of the autonomic symptoms like increased salivation, increased perspiration or sweating, goose flashes and sometimes may even have rhythm disturbances in the heart that is cardiac arrhythmias which obviously itself can be fatal. A characteristic finding noted in these rabies patients is what is called as hydrophobia or fear of water. Now why does this happen? Whenever a patient tries to drink water, his throat muscles, chest muscles and diaphragm go into excessive spasm and cause tremendous amount of pain to the patient. This is so dreadful and even a mere thought of drinking water can elicit this widespread spasm. This whole experience is so frantic to the patient and he just ends up fearing water. In fact, sometimes this can also happen with drift of air touching the skin of the patient and leading to what is called as aerophobia. Now, all these symptoms rapidly progress and within few days, patient drifts to coma and then eventually death. While in paralytic rabies, there is early onset of prominent weakness of the bitten limb which is then followed by uh, weakness that is paralysis of rest of the limbs, the facial muscles etc. Now a characteristic hydrophobia is absent in this condition. Then eventually all the muscles of the body go into paralysis and obviously the patient dies. So as you can see, once the symptoms begin, this is a condition associated with 100% death rate. And what makes it even worse is this death is preceded by a few days of extreme torture to the patient. So it's needless to say that the most important aspect of rabies is the prevention of rabies. So the prevention of rabies can be discussed under these three headings. Now let's first look at the post exposure prophylaxis. That means what needs to be done when a person is bitten by a rabies suspected dog or any other wild animal. Now obviously before this you need to know few of the characteristics in a dog which suggest that the dog may be infected with rabies. Now out of all this the most important ones are the unprovoked bite by a dog or excessive salivation seen in a dog. So once a person is bitten by a rabid animal the most important goal is to prevent the viral particles from getting into the nervous system and this is an emergency. First and foremost thing that needs to be done is wash the wound thoroughly with soap and running tap water for at least 15 minutes and this needs to be done within few minutes to hours from the time of bite. Washing the wound with running tap water will wash away most of the viral particles and this washing is so important that washing alone can decrease the chances of getting a rabies infection by about 80%. Now if there is a deep punctured wound, it is even advised to insert some sort of catheter and irrigate the wound with plenty of water. Now after this washing of the wound is done, it is better to apply some alcohol based solution like a sanitizer or povidone iodine solution which basically act as a virucidal agent. A very important thing to note here is that even if the wound requires suturing, that is even if the wound requires stitches, it is better to withhold for about 24 to 48 hours simply because the very procedure of suturing can be traumatic and it can even increase the chances of viral particles getting into the nerve endings. However, if stitches are necessary, they are to be done after about 24 to 48 hours under cover of immunoglobulin administration. 
Now, obviously, in addition to all these things, the patient also needs to receive antibiotics and TT injections to prevent the bacterial infection. Now, before we proceed, you need to understand two terms, a vaccine and an immunoglobulin. Now, what's a vaccine? A vaccine is an inactivated component of the virus, which when injected into the body, initiates an immune response. Basically, it makes the body produce the defense equipments, which will help in fighting against the vaccine and hence also fight against the virus. While the immunoglobulin is basically a ready-made supply of all these equipments which are necessary to fight against the virus. Now what's important is those defense equipments which our body synthesizes after uh, receiving the vaccine is way more competent and way more efficient in fighting against the virus than the externally provided ready-made immunoglobulins. Now that is why vaccine is way more efficient than providing immunoglobulin. But immunoglobulins are just provided as an emergency measure. An attack victim should receive these depending on the severity of the injury. Well, as you can see, a bite will directly place it in category 3 and he needs to receive both vaccine as well as immunoglobulin, obviously in addition to the local wound care. There are different regimens of rabies vaccination and the most commonly used is the SN regimen where rabies vaccine, most commonly used is the Rabipure, is uh, injected intramuscularly to deltoid or thigh on day 0, 3, 7, 14 and 28. Now what's day 0 here? Is it the day of bite? Well, not necessarily. Day 0 is the first day when the patient receives the vaccination. And after this, the days are calculated accordingly. Now on this first day of receiving the vaccine, patient also needs to receive immunoglobulins around the bite site and whatever remains needs to be injected intramuscularly at a site away from the site of injection of vaccine. Now that is because we do not want the vaccine and the immunoglobulin to nullify each other's effect. Now an important question arises that is should you receive these vaccination if you are bitten by someone's pet dog? Well the wound care needs to be done as advised. But about receiving the vaccination, it depends on a few factors, most important being the vaccination status of the dog and also any recent changes in the behavior of the dog. But it is always safer to initiate the vaccination and you can as well discontinue it after 10 days if the dog is asymptomatic but obviously under the supervision of an expert doctor. However, any street dog bite or a dog bite where a dog cannot be traced or in case of a wild animal bite, the entire course of vaccination must be given, especially considering the severity of the infection that can happen. Pre-exposure prophylaxis, as the word indicates, is given before the dog or wild bite. Now obviously this is not required for the general public and it is required only for those individuals working or residing in high-risk environments like laboratories dealing with animals or wet clinics or travelers with extensive wild exposure etc. Now these individuals need to receive Rabipure that is vaccine on day 0, day 7 and day 21 or 28. Immunoglobulins are not indicated for pre-exposure prophylaxis. If these vaccinated individuals end up getting a rabid animal bite then the antibody titer in their body needs to be checked and if it is more than 0.5 they don't need any other immunoglobulin and they just need to receive Rabipure on day 0 and day 3. So this was about rabies in humans and its prevention. So I have not touched upon rabies in dogs and dog vaccination in this video. Maybe we can discuss this in one of the upcoming videos. Meanwhile if you found this video informative do make sure that you give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends and family and for more health and wellness related videos, subscribe to this channel. Thank you.